Hey there, in this video we are talking about passing pointers into functions and returning pointers from functions in C++, and this covers sections 9.7 to 9.9 .9 in the Gaddis C++ book. This is actually our last lecture on chapter 9, we're going to go on to other stuff after this. Okay, so we know that we're always going to make modular programs. Uh, we're making larger and larger programs, and uh, for mental focus we need to separate those out into small functions. I, I recommend like around seven lines long, hopefully. And you can also parse out the work to multiple other programmers as a result. So anytime we see a new uh, data object in C++, we need to learn how to pass it into and out of functions. So of course, a pointer can be a parameter that gets sent into a function. I mean, a pointers are just really numbers, of course. So uh, what happens when you do that is it winds up working like a reference variable, which allows you to change the argument from within the function. Now, personally, I kind of want to say that reference variables work like pointers because historically pointers came first, right? They're built into the CPUs, right? They were in C++ and C from day one, and reference variables were created later on, which is more or less just a mask over pointers happening for you. So reference variables are really just pointers happening one step removed. So uh, when you do that, right, um, you're going to require an asterisk on the parameter type in the prototype in the heading. So if this is your uh, prototype or you're the header to your function, void get num, the type here is integer pointer, right? And you're giving it a good name, a good identifier, like PTR is probably perfectly fine. Uh, if you left off the asterisk, you wouldn't be sending an integer pointer, you'd be sending an integer value, which would be different. Okay, so you'd have it there for the type. And then in your function, when you want to use that data, you've got to dereference it. You've got to dereference it to actually use, access the data that's at that location. So maybe you, for a user input function, uh, write something in and then store it in that location of star pointer. Now, when you actually call the function, of course, you gotta pass it not just the variable, you have to pass the address of the variable. How do you get the address? Well, that's what the ampersand symbol is for here. So when I actually call this particular function, get num, I'm gonna have to, and maybe, you know, I, I have a number called num, I have to call call it with ampersand num to get the address of num and send that in because that is what an integer pointer expects to receive. So a little bit more writing. You can see why, see reference variables were made to cut down on the writing. With reference variables, you don't have to see the ampersand, you don't have to see this pointer, you don't have to dereference it with a pointer. But this is what, you're, what is really happening uh, when reference uh, variables do their job. Um, and you are actually really using pointers. So here we're, we're actually seeing it happen. So here's a good example of that. Uh, you know, a, a little function we might want to use in our code sometimes is a swap function to swap the values of two variables. We saw this in our algorithm for the bubble sort, right? The bubble sort is comparing two things, and then the work it has to do is to swap the values of two different variables. So that code would have looked nicer if we had had a dedicated function that just does the swap job, that was just a little bit confusing back when we saw bubble sort. It wasn't really the canonical issue in, involved. So um, it would be nice if you had a swap function. Here, you can do that with pointers. So I have two pointers pointing to the location of these two things that I want to swap, an integer pointer called x and an integer pointer called y. And just like we saw before, you have to have a third temporary variable because if I have two things and I just copy this into this, uh, I just overwrote this and now they both have the same number and that's not what you want. So I have to have this third temporary variable and whatever is in the location for x, you see the dereferencer there, get the, get the contents of x, store that in temp. Okay, now get the, take the contents of y and you can put that in x, that's fine. Right now they both have the same thing. And finally get what's in temp and store that in the location for y. And effectively you have swapped the values of these two things. So uh, as a test of calling that, I could have num1 holding 2, I could have num2 holding negative 3, I could call this swap function. You're going to see the ampersands, because with pointer arithmetic I've got to pass in the address of where these things are, and then afterwards, after this function does its job, they both changed, and num1 is holding negative 3, and num2 is holding 2 like you wanted. Okay, so could you do this whole job with reference variables? Sure, you could make x and y references instead. But this is kind of the old school way, and truth be told, this is what's really actually happening when you use reference variables. So it's kind of handy to actually visually see that. You will see this maybe in slightly older code or more you know, technical code. You'll see it like this instead.
So here uh, we see that in program 911, the book, uh, this program uses two functions that accept the addresses of variables as arguments. So the prototypes are on lines seven and eight. You've got this get number function uh, that takes an integer pointer, and you have this double value function that takes an integer pointer. So for what it's worth, uh, get number on line seven, that is an input function, and we are actually in the habit of making our input functions void functions, but they take a pointer or a reference to uh, hold and be changed and store the information the user is going to type in for us. So that's how we usually set up our input functions. And then item, uh, the function on line eight, double value, that's a processing function. It's going to change whatever you pass in, hopefully multiplying it by two, right? You're going to see the definitions of those functions in the next slide, but for now, the main test driver uh, creates an integer for number, declares some data to begin with, of course, calls the functions, calls get number, and you pass, pass in the address of where number is to get the user input. And then you call double value, again, pass in the address so that that function can access and change this location. And at the end, hopefully it's gonna say that value doubled is whatever number is now, having been changed by this double value call. I will point out when you write your code, you never have to write one comment, one line, right? This is being very super, super careful to make sure everyone understands what's happening here. But when you write your code, do not write one comment, one line, one comment, one line. Comments are supposed to summarize a bunch of lines that programmers can then dig into. That's the one thing I would personally change about this. Here are the definitions of those two functions with a very nice comment like we expect before every function. So get number takes in an integer pointer, it's being called input. And of course it prompts the user and you can sin into star input, right? Whatever you write for star, that's gonna become the contents of that location. So you dereference your pointer anytime you're doing count or math or a sin statement, right? Here I'm talking about the contents over there is what I wanna change. And then uh, double value here takes an integer pointer. We're calling it val here. And what it, we're saying is the contents in val, there's the dereference again, right? Combined assignment, go multiply it by two and overwrite what used to be there. So uh, yeah, that actually will change the value that got passed in. If I didn't use pointers, if I didn't use references, normally you can't change what was back in the main function. But by using pointers or references, you can do that. And if you run this whole program, and the user actually does enter 10 for the input on line 34, right? You then pass that address into double value. It actually will change, and the main function will actually print out the number 20. It's a good example of using pointers for parameters coming into a function for specifically for stuff that needs to change. For an input function where you need to store the user input someplace, or for a processing function that wants to change a variable. Now, here's the other side of the story, right? Getting pointers back out of a function with return statements. So these types, these pointer types, are legitimate return types for a function. So here I'm making a function called newNum, and the return type is integer pointer. And of course, you wrote that with integer with, uh, with int with an asterisk. Integer pointer is the return type. That's what it's going to return. The places where you would see this, the customary times you would want to do this, and you're going to see more examples, you know, hopefully later in your career, but the primary times you'd want to do this is if the function dynamically allocates memory and sets it up in some interesting way, then just like the operating system does, when you use the new operator, your function can return a pointer for the address where this block of memory is sitting that it itself actually got from the operating system with the new operator. Now, when you do that, if you have a function that's setting up a new block of memory, right, with new, and you hand that pointer back to somebody else, the caller has to remember to free it with delete at some point, right? Some later point, that block of memory has to get freed. And so that's actually a major uh, danger zone of calling a function like that, and then you forgetting that now it's your responsibility to delete it when you're done with that. So be really careful with that kind of situation, but we do that uh, sometimes. The other thing that we sometimes do is uh, have a function that takes a pointer in as a parameter and then just returns the exact same thing back out. And what that allows us to do is chain function calls. You can do, you know, call func, call func, call func, call func. And as the first one gets done, it returns a pointer and then you send that in the second one. And that returns it and you send that in the third one. So you can chain function calls by whatever the input was is the exact same thing as the return value, or maybe modified a little bit, 
um, and that makes it a little bit easier to write certain types of code. The thing you definitely don't want to do is definitely don't return a pointer to a locally declared variable. Right? If I'm returning a pointer, it had to be uh, previously set up properly or probably dynamically allocated. So if you try to make a local variable, right, you didn't use new, it's a local variable, and you try to return the address of that from your function, that's going to be super broken because remember when a function stops working, the data frame with the local variables gets swept out of the memory system, right? It gets recycled and deleted after the function. So you can return the address to somebody, but the place that it's pointing to doesn't have legitimate memory anymore, right? It was wiped out and probably it's now used for something totally different and what you expected to be sitting there will be not what you expect. So uh, definitely don't try to return pointers to local variables because one second later it won't be there. Here's an example of that first job of a function that's going to get a new block of memory and set it up in some interesting way and return a pointer to that block of memory. So this function is called get random numbers. And the whole point here is I've got a program and at some point I need some random numbers. So I'm going to make a big array and this will automatically make the big array of whatever size you want and set the whole thing up with just random numbers and then I can use them for my maybe my encryption program later on. Uh, this program takes in an integer for the number of random numbers that I want, okay? And at the end, it's gonna return an integer pointer for where is this new array that's been set up with totally random numbers, okay? So line 36 uh, makes an integer pointer called array. We're, in just a second, we're about to dynamically allocate a brand new array. There's a little check here uh, just to make sure that the num makes sense. Remember, you cannot allocate an array of negative size. It just doesn't make any sense at all. Can't, can't allocate zero size as well. So this is a check here that says, if num is lesser than or equal to zero, return null. Jump out of the function. Got to return some kind of pointer. Uh, this was written a little while ago, so it's using the null constant to say return the zero keyword. I guess if we wrote it in modern C++, we would say return null pointer now. Okay, just get out and just return the null pointer to say we couldn't do that. Uh, but assuming you get past that, here on line 43, we're declaring a new integer array of size num, whatever got passed in, right? Goes to the operating system, find a big enough array for me. Uh, it could be thousands or millions of bytes long possibly. Tell me where it is, take the address, store it in the array pointer. Now that I have that block, I need to go through and I need to fill it with random numbers. So here's the standard random number thing that we talk about in semester one. We, we seed the randomizer with the SRAND function. Again, it's really just a math calculation uh, one number leads to the next, and so we just have to start off the calculation, the formula, with some kind of number to begin with. And that's what we mean by seeding the randomizer, just getting the first number in the calculation. The first number we use here is a call to time, which is actually the current clock time in seconds since 1980. But the point is, it's some kind of number, and it's different every time you're on the program. So start the calculation with this, have a loop that goes over the whole array that you just allocated, and set array bracket count to a call to the randomizer function, to rand, right? And every single one ought to be a different number, um, uh, unpredictable number at least, and you filled up the whole array with random numbers. Finally, on line 54, you return array. Remember, that's an address, right? That's really a pointer. It's an integer pointer to comply with a return type. And whoever called me can take that, store it in their own pointer, and then use that as an array of numbers that are all random. Great. So I feel this is a very important example. It's a very important example, and I hope that you will study and inspect that kind of carefully to think about this issue of a function that gets a block of uh, memory using new, sets it up in some interesting way, and then hands off the pointer to where that is to some other function that then can use it, and that other function has to remember to use delete. Okay, so we do this sometimes, very useful technique, and make sure that that makes sense to you. So here we are at the end of chapter nine for us, and this actually represents the end of what I call part one of the course in second semester programming. So at least in my courses, the next thing that would happen is we'd have a test over uh, our review component and chapter eight on searching and sorting and chapter nine on pointers for what it's worth. So what I do is I ask my students um, to get ready for that. I ask them to read book chapter nine. I say, if they're gonna get an A in the course, they should look at all these other examples and details that we didn't have time for in our lectures. 
They should look at the review questions at the end of chapter nine, particularly the fill in the blank stuff, which kind of reflects part of my tests. There is a programming challenge on chapter nine on pointers. So my students should look at the learning management system and see exactly what that is and when it's due. And I always have a practice version of the test, a model version of what the test is gonna look like. So my students should definitely review practice test one and all the answers are there. And if they have questions or something surprising there, they should ask about it on email or one of our in-person sessions. Now, in addition to that, as an optional thing, you know, how do you become a better programmer? The answer is always do more programming. So if you do have more time and you really wanna be a professional grade programmer, I would recommend a couple other exercises aside from the challenge that I actually collect and grade. The best ones at this point um, in chapter nine is I would highly recommend uh, programming challenge 910 and 9.11 and 9.12. And I think they're all exercising that thing on the last slide we were just talking about, like that get random number array of a function that allocates a new array, sets it up in an interesting way, and hands back a pointer to somebody else so they know where this is. So I think this actually practices all of these things. Fairly good practice of modularizing programs, practicing pointers, practicing dynamically allocating memory, and then returning pointers to some other caller. So those are pretty good exercises. Optionally, if you have some extra time and you're interested in getting some extra practice in, and if you have more time than that, then feel free to do anything in the programming challenges. It would all be good. And then finally, my students would do this. We'd do this lab on uh, using a dynamic array to compute averages. And the assignment here that we would do together in class is write a program that will read scores into an array the size of the array should be input by the user, right, using dynamic allocation, because that wouldn't work under ISO rules with a local array. And the goal is the program should find and print out the average of the scores. Now, even if you're not in my class, you can totally do this on your own. Uh, this is a program we just write from scratch. There's no starter file like for some of the other labs. So whether you're in my class or not, you should, you should try this as exercise. One thing to keep in mind, again, we're writing modular programs, right? We are not gonna write one giant line of statements in the main function. We're never gonna do that. So you should expect that you want one dedicated function just for the input job, right? The main function will declare, you know, declare some data, but the, there should be an input function that just does the input job from the user of how many things do you want and uh, tell me what the data is to store. There should be a separate function for the processing Right, where, you, where you pass in the array and the size and it computes the average and returns that as a number. And there should be at least a third function that does the output job of getting that average and printing it to the screen. And the main function should declare data and call all those functions. So good practice, again, making separate functions, passing pointers or really arrays into these functions as they do their input and their processing and their output job. So good practice all around for that. Um, when we come back, so again, my students are getting ready for their, uh, their first test at this point in the course. When we come back next time, uh, we're going to start on uh, what I call part two of the course, and we'll kind of briefly look at chapter 10 that digs into more details about exactly how strings work. And of course, strings are really arrays of characters. So we're going to touch back on these topics of arrays and pointers a little bit more when we do that. I'll see you for that.